You guys in the back room, can I ask you to advance the slide? Yeah, there we go. Now, just a word about share prices, because many of you are interested in how can I use innovations to keep the share price of my company growing attractively. Now, I'll plot on the vertical axis on the, right, the left-hand side of that diagram a company's share price over time. Every company's share price has two components to it. One component is the discounted present value of the cash flows that are foreseeable from the existing businesses in your company. Then there's another component of the share price, which is a bet that investors are making that this particular management team is going to be able to create new growth beyond what the existing businesses are going to generate. And so your share price has those two components, and based upon the company, that bet that you're going to be able to create new growth may be a very small bet or it may be a very large bet, but it's there. Now the frustrating thing is if you then succeed in delivering the growth that is foreseeable from the existing business and if you deliver the growth that investors are betting that you'll be able to create through new innovations, the reward of that will be that your share price doesn't move. So a way to think about this is the share price is some sort of a discounted present value of foreseeable growth. If you own the shares of a company and the market all of a sudden realizes, gosh, it's going to grow faster than we thought, then that means we can pay more for the stock and so the stock will take a pop. But then if the company succeeds in delivering that newly estimated trajectory of growth, the share price won't change because they already have discounted that into, the, into your stock price. So if you're owning it, when the stock market re-estimates what it will do, you make an attractive return. But then if the company delivers, the, the return is just at the market rate. So the only way that you can create new, uh, the growth that the, will keep the company's share price going up is if you keep surprising the investors on the upside oh my gosh, there's more growth there than we thought, and they're willing to pay a higher price. And it turns out that these investments in disruption almost invariably create market returns that are way above what the stock market on average does. And there's a sound theoretical reason for it. It's just like the established competitors systematically underestimate how big these folks at the bottom of the market will become, Wall Street's traditional metrics of financial analysis simply cannot, they, they, they systematically underestimate how big the disruptors will become. And so if you want to keep your share price moving up at faster than market rates, what it means is you've got to keep surprising the market as represented by that red line. And the best way to do it is to create these disruptive innovations that have the, the, the capability to keep generating those surprises. Can we go to the next slide, please? Now, I want to make the diagram just a little bit more complicated, unfortunately, to talk about some of the advantages that I see for companies who have a base here or in China or in Vietnam. It's, I depicted the mini-mill problem all in the same plane of competition where the mini mills came in at the bottom of a market and then went up. And in this diagram, in the back plane there, you can see what I label low-end disruption. And low-end disruption occurs when the leaders have made products that are now more than good enough for what people in the middle or the bottom of the market actually needs. And somebody figures out a low-cost business model to do the same thing cheaper. So the mini mills were a low-end disruption. Walmart and Target and, the, and Carrefour, the discount retailers, were low-end disruptors relative to the big high-end department stores, and now they're moving up market. But most of the world's disruptions come out actually in a third plane of competition, and we call those new market disruptions. And they occur when somebody figures out that in that back plane the products were so expensive that only people with a lot of money and a lot of skill could have them. And they, de they develop a simplifying technology that enables a whole new group of customers now to own and use the product. 
Um, a, and a great example of that for me was the personal computer. When I got out of graduate school, if I wanted to compute, I had to take a thick um, stack of punched cards to the corporate mainframe center and give it to an expert who ran the job for me. It was just so complicated and expensive, we didn't compute very often. But then when the personal computer came out, it made it so affordable and simple that even a poor fool like me can own a computer and use it. At the beginning, we just did the simple things like typing and word processing on the PC platform. And we still had to take the complicated problems to the mainframe center for the expert to process. But as that PC got better and better and better and better, you then could begin doing in this low-cost convenient platform the kind of jobs that could only be done in the mainframe. And one by one, the applications got sucked out of the back into the front and all of the mainframe and mini computer companies were just driven out of the computer hardware market by people like Compaq and Dell. Now, when you have this opportunity to compete against non-consumption by making things affordable and simple, the established competitors in a market almost never do that. But rather because out there in the green space, it appears as if the market is so small, it's not attractive. And so they try to cram this new technology into the market that they're currently serving. And let me just give a historical example and then maybe talk about alternative energy. Um, the, the transistor was a disruptive technology relative to the vacuum tube. And those of you with a bit of gray hair might remember what, how televisions were built in the 1950s and 60s. They were huge things that sat, stood on the floor in today's dollars, they cost about 2000 just to have a, a, a television, and so most people didn't even own one. The transistor, when it came in, was disruptive relative to the vacuum tube because it could not handle the power that was required to build these big machines. Every one of the vacuum tube companies took a license to the transistor, and then they carried the license into their own laboratories and targeted the blue space where they already were competing with their existing customers. And they framed it as a technological problem. In other words, there is no market for the transistors yet because they're not good enough to be used in making big computers. And these are the giants of the electronics industry at the time. RCA, Zenith, General Electric, Westinghouse, Philips, Siemens, and so on. And in today's dollars, that set of companies spent almost $3 billion trying to make the transistor good enough that it could be used in the market. While they were working on that problem, out here, competing against non-consumption, the first application was a tiny germanium transistor hearing aid that actually didn't need a lot of power. And then in 1955, Sony introduced its first pocket radio. And again, those of you with gray hair, do you remember how crummy those early Sony radios were? Just horrible fidelity, laced with static, but for $2 you could buy one and stick it in your pocket. Sony chose to sell its transistor radios not to the parents back in the blue space, but to the low end of humanity, people that we call teenagers today. And the teenagers were just delighted to have a crummy product because it was infinitely better than their other alternative, which was no radio at all. And then as a market emerged there, Sony just kept making that solid state electronics better and better. In 1959, they then introduced their first portable television. Again, a very limited product, but it was so simple and affordable that a whole new population of people whose bank accounts had been too small or whose apartments were too small to have a big RCA TV, now they could have this little one. And because it was infinitely better than nothing, they were delighted to have a limited product. And the companies in the blue space continued to spend money on R&D and they felt no pain because these were all new customers. But then by the mid-1960s, solid state electronics had gotten good enough that you could now do in solid state the big things that in the past had required vacuum tubes. And within three years, all the customers got sucked out of the vacuum tube market into the new one. And every one of the vacuum tube companies were vaporized. Not because they didn't see the technology, 
They saw it long before Sony, not because they lacked commitment. They easily spent 30 times more money trying to make the technology work in their market than Sony ever meant spent making it work in its market. But they got killed because they were unwilling or unable to create a new business model that had a different cost structure to be able to compete successfully against non-consumption. And that really is the key to creating that new growth because it appears as if non-consumption is a small market. Actually, in almost every case, it's huge. Now, let's evaluate this in terms of what we're doing with alternative energy. Have you ever wondered whether solar energy is going to make it? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Because the U.S. and European governments together have spent almost $16 billion trying to make solar energy good enough that it can be used in North America and Europe. This is a very difficult problem because our buildings are all air conditioned. We leave the lights on all night. There are genuine technical problems like night happens every day, clouds get in the way. And somehow to expect that solar energy will ever become good enough that we could put these panels on the roofs of our buildings and clip the cord to the mainstream generation station, which is very efficient and very well developed and very reliable. This is a pipe dream. It will just never happen. Now, in the midst of my wondering about this, uh, one of our daughters served as a missionary for our church in Mongolia for a couple of years. And when she was done with her service, uh, we took our family over there to have Annie give us a tour of Mongolia. It's a kind of once-in-a-lifetime chance to go to the edge of the world. And while we were there, Annie took us in the capital city of Ulaanbaatar to this mammoth open-air bazaar. And we happened upon a line of vendors that were selling dirt-cheap solar panels, where the material was sputtered on glass rather than silicon wafers, and they were shrink-wrapped with rabbit ears antennas and little six-inch black and white televisions. And these things are moving out of the market like you can't believe. Well, it turns out that nearly half of Mongolia's population have no access to electricity at all. They live in these tents called gares that they follow their herds around the countryside. And because of that, none of the gares are air conditioned, nor do they leave the lights on all night. And oh, who cares if it was cloudy today? I couldn't watch TV yesterday. And while in North America and Europe, we just wonder whether there will ever be a market that does not need to be subsidized, out here competing against non-consumption, solar energy is a booming business. And my guess is that whether the technology ever gets good enough that it can be used in North America or Europe won't come from massive technological investments in the developing, developed world, but rather just the folks out there on the ground trying to make a, a simple, affordable product better and better, and it will drag the applications one by one. For a similar way, companies like Suzlon Energy here in India that, that do wind power products are in so much better an, a place than people where there is no non-consumption of energy. Uh, and what scares me the most about India and China as disruptive economies actually is not low labor cost because that's a very transitory advantage, but it is all of the non-consumption that exists in these markets that constitutes the ideal customer base for these big waves of disruptive growth. Now, I wanted just to talk about outsourcing for a minute, and I'd like you to, uh, in the back room, keep advancing the slides until I tell you to stop, please. 